Welcome to this meeting of the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission, January 26, 2022. The meeting will come to order. Roll call, please. First, Congressional District Commissioner Kevin Potter. Here. Second, Congressional District Commissioner David Conway. Here. Third, Congressional District Commissioner Charles Ortega. Here. Fourth, Congressional District Commissioner Lindy Ritz. Here. Fifth, Congressional District Commissioner Blake Rainey. Here. At large, Commissioner Jim Putnam. Here. At large, Commissioner Chairman Jerry Hunter. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. The draft of the minutes of the December 14th, 2021 meeting was sent to you last week. A copy is in your meeting packet. Are there any corrections to the meeting, uh, to the minutes as distributed? If not, uh, if there are no further corrections, I will accept motions to approve the minutes as distributed. So Roll call, moved. please. Uh, I so move that we approve. Second. Done. I'm sorry? Commissioner Potter. Abstain. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Chairman Hunter. Aye. <coughs> The next order of business is item four. Chairman, commissioners. Had the good gavel mark there, Mr. Chairman. Sounds like you're uh, ready to go. I appreciate it. With authority. Um, <clears throat> uh, our uh, new aviation intern for this uh, spring semester, uh, unfortunately his uh, class schedule is not allowing him to uh, be here uh, on this Wednesday, but uh, Hanil uh, Rathod, uh, and I know I've butchered that, so uh, my apologies to uh, his supervisor and, and Hanil, but, and hopefully you'll get to see him at some point in time. He comes to us from the OU <coughs> Aviation Program, um, has a pretty good background there. I believe he is a junior, am I correct? Uh, I think he's a senior this year. Senior. Okay. So he has shown some pretty good uh, attentiveness to what we do here at the Aeronautics Commission. Um, as you can see there, a uh, nice, nice young gentleman. Uh, and he's going to be working with, with Nick and the airports team to make sure that we have everything that we need and also make sure that we can expose him to all the great things that Aviation Aerospace has to offer. Uh, it's, it's a great partnership. Uh, it helps us build our pipeline, helps us build the pipeline for Aviation Aerospace in the state. Uh, and also uh, gives us a little extra to work effort uh, to help the staff. So welcome, Hanil, and, and we'll see him probably at a couple of the different events that we have throughout the year. I might add, uh, I don't know how many applicants you had this time, but this has turned into a highly coveted position, and a lot of kids are, are wanting to come because of the broad exposure. It's uh, It has. It's come a long way since I was the uh, probably the first intern <clears throat> way back in the day. We have to go back a little ways for that. But um, he, what we have seen over the years, we've had as many as you know a dozen applicants for our intern. It, it's, it picks up a lot in the summertime. Uh, the summertime internship is, is a pretty exciting one. And uh, of course, you know, OU is, is a great program. OSU is a great program. OSU, we occasionally get students apply for the uh, spring and fall during class. It, it can be kind of tough. So mo mostly the, the OSU and Southeastern students will apply for the summer program uh, just because of a, of a living and a moving standpoint. It's, it's easier for logistics. But yeah, it is becoming a pretty exciting internship. And I have heard the, uh, the rumors moving about the different student bodies that, you know, all the things that you get exposed to at the Aeronautics Commission, all the, the neat things that we get to touch as an agency. That, that is it, Mr. Chairman. I will stand for any questions or additional comments. Are there any questions? Okay, um, Grayson, I believe you're up for item four, to present item number four, which is the introduction of a new aviation program intern that we, that we just covered. Item five, introduction of new unmanned aerial systems program manager. <clears throat> Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I uh, have a, a new uh, staff member here. Uh, Doug Wood is, is with us, uh, joined uh, just a couple of weeks ago. He's been drinking from a fire hose. As we know, uh, UAS and AAM, whatever we're going to call it, they're all fairly interchangeable. 
um, whether it's the, the small unmanned aircraft drones that are being used by fire departments, police departments, first responders, uh, oil and gas companies, et cetera, all the way on to the, the very large uh, passenger or cargo type drones that are going to be carrying things that are going to be autonomously uh, piloted, uh, it runs the gamut. <clears throat> we see in Oklahoma where we're trying to position ourselves uh, in this particular industry is to be that hub for testing, research, and development, uh, as well as manufacturing the end product. Uh, we have a lot of uh, open airspace. Uh, obviously, we have some pretty neat things going on in our two research universities. The Choctaw Nation, the Osage Nation, Cherokee Nation all have uh, various UAS programs, AAM programs in some form or fashion. And uh, this is one of those things that uh, myself, uh, my predecessor, uh, several in the state have all looked to. And, and given the new legislation that was passed last year, naming the Aeronautics Commission as kind of that, that coalescing organization within state government for UAS and AAM, uh, we needed to dedicate a, a full-time staffer to that position. So, so Doug Wood comes to us from a <clears throat> career in law enforcement. Uh, last five years, he was in the UAS field, was the UAS team leader, but I'm going to shut up there and invite Doug to come up and tell a little bit about himself and uh, what he's looking forward to. Good morning, Chairman Hunter, Commission. Um, a little about myself. Uh, I'm from Manhattan, Kansas, born and raised, um, and got into law enforcement uh, in my hometown, which I really appreciated. I've been married on the personal side. I've been married for 25 years. My wife's actually an Oklahoma girl. She was born in Boise City. Um, grew up on a small farm cow-calf operation in southeast Colorado, but came to Oklahoma State, got her bachelor's degree, and then uh, drifted north where she ended up meeting me, and um, we got married. So uh, we've been married about 25 years. We have two adult children, one who just graduated from Kansas State University and another who's a junior. On the professional side, uh, I joined the Riley County Police Department back in 1996 and served 25 years before I retired. Um, primarily doing most of what law enforcement officers do, patrol officer, patrol sergeant. Um, I was in charge of court security for three years. I was in charge of the county unit for three years as a supervisor. And then in 2016, I got interested in unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, met a gentleman who let me fly his drone for the first time and it was a very interesting thing. Um, I became interested in that. I got my own Part 107, and then my department asked me about uh, using drones for law enforcement and standing up a team. Um, so over the next five years, uh, our department spent pretty close to $100,000 on uh, drones, on the transport vehicle, on having v uh, drones available on patrol um, for immediate use. Um, and we were very successful uh, moving that program forward over that time frame. Um, I guess the last thing is I was also a member of the United States Navy and Navy Reserve. I enlisted uh, way back when I was 17 uh, and spent 23 years in the reserves, retiring in 2008. And primarily I was involved in firearms training, use of force training, uh, physical security, anti-terrorism force protection. Um, and my last uh, duty station was a reserve unit attached to Naval Station Yokosuka, Japan, uh, where we did mostly physical security missions. So. That's kind of my background in both law enforcement. I'm very excited to uh, be starting this next chapter, and I'm very excited to get to work with the local agencies and use my experience in law enforcement with public safety, emergency management, as well as learn about all of the uh, much larger uh, AAM projects and things like that. So uh, as the director said, I don't know if he was looking for a broke down cop when he was looking for to fill this position, but that's what he got. And uh, so I'll do the best that I can to, to meet his and your expectations. And if that's, do you have any questions? Welcome. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the pres presentation, Mr. Wood. All right. Good day. Um, our next item is uh, the director's report. Mr. Arnes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, brief director's report. Uh, of course, it's only been about a month since we've last met. And of course, we had a couple of holidays uh, over that time period. So. Uh, <clears throat> things had been a little uh, quieter than usual. Uh, I had the opportunity to go speak to uh, University of Oklahoma's new uh, aerospace and defense uh, professional MBA, executive MBA program at uh, the Delaware Resource Group. On December 16th, I guess kind of told them about the, the statewide perspective. Uh, these folks were just about to graduate. I think they were graduating a couple of days after I spoke. Uh, just to talk to them about aviation aerospace, these are uh, not only Oklahomans uh, that are looking to advance their degrees, but also folks from outside the state 
that are trying to get this additional uh, degree for their uh, professional status and had I think about 15 different students from a variety of careers, someone in defense, someone in civil aviation, someone in education. Uh, it, ran, it ran the gamut and at the end of the day, uh, pretty good discussion, had, had lots of questions. Obviously the key question on everybody's mind is, is how do we uh, solve the, the workforce challenge in Oklahoma, uh, most of the Oklahoma folks. And there's a couple of Texas people too that had, had similar questions of how do we solve the workforce challenge of aviation aerospace. Um, and so we had a, a good probably 20 minute discussion and, and could have gone for much longer if we not had to be, if we, it didn't have to be cut off for the, uh, the next speaker. Uh, following on that, I uh, was able to uh, moderate a program for the Oklahoma Airport Operators Association, uh, the OCAP uh, program, the Oklahoma Certified Airport Professionals Program, is something that OAOA is standing up. Uh, we know there's the AAAE, which is the National Association for Airport Executives. Uh, they have a great accreditation certification program. We definitely know we're not going to suppl supplement or supplant that. We just want to have something that's just a little extra. Uh, in Oklahoma and, and hopefully can educate not just the professional airport managers in the state, but also the city managers, the public works directors, the, the volunteer mayors or the board members or folks that are not as uh, educated or directly experienced with airport management and hopefully get them the, the full picture of, of what's going on. So I hosted a, a great panel on, on business attraction and economic development. Uh, <clears throat> our panelists were Alicia Pearson with the ACES program. Uh, Mita Bates from the Armour Development Authority, who just recently retired, uh, and Lisa Powell from the Enid uh, Jobs Found, the Enid Regional Development Alliance, uh, which is their economic development arm, and had about 20, uh, 20 25 airports partake and, and show up to hear about business attraction and, and how do you have a business ready airport uh, from the perspective of wanting to develop that airport, build out hangars, build out commercial uh, real estate type ventures. Uh, and so it was good. It was a good panel, uh, about an hour long. And at the end of the day, uh, I hope that the airports are able to walk away with something to be able to say, okay, here's how I can be a more business ready airport uh, for the long term. And, and at the end of the day, this is something that's going to continue throughout the year and, and hopefully it will be a reoccurring program, program for OAOA. Uh, on Thursday, we have another uh, OCAP training session on pavement management that staff is going to be. Uh, uh, partaking in and so uh, it's going to happen every month probably maybe a couple of programs every month and so we'll report on those as they happen and as we're involved in them but a uh, good thing for OAOA. <clears throat> Follow that on with the OAOA's uh, general membership meeting uh, in Guthrie. Uh, Shalon Stanley was glad enough to, uh, to host us up there at the new uh, Meridian Tech Center which is just across the street from the airport and had a, had a great facility there um, and at the end of the day uh, OAOA kind of brief them on what the, the state of the industry was. This is their last quarterly meeting before the annual meeting that happens uh, later this spring. And we just get opportunity to get around to discuss some of the things, some of the challenges that are happening with aviation aerospace. And then last but not least, we had the, or excuse me, second to last, we had the Advanced Mobility Council meeting on January 20th. That was right here actually in this room uh, among several of the members of the Advanced Mobility Council. That was our second meeting ever of the Advanced Mobility Council. Uh, obviously this is focusing not just on ground transportation but also air transportation as well and all those uh, advanced technologies that are impacting uh, the various modes of transportation, particularly with focus on the autonomous side. So autonomous ground vehicles, autonomous air vehicles, uh, and how can we as a state from a policy, regulatory, and support perspective be ready for the adoptions of those technologies. We'll also talk about other things like uh, sustainable aviation fuel, um, <clears throat> electrification of traditional aircraft, uh, hybrid aircraft, hydrogen powered aircraft, so on and so forth. And that's looking forward to a, a pretty good uh, group there, I have nine members on that and, and also other participants as well. Uh, are we as the agency OAC, we will be staffing that council for the secretary and, and Doug Wood who you just Met will be a, a primary staffer for that particular effort, and at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be a, a good feather in our cap, but a good feather in Oklahoma's cap, and hopefully we'll be able to make some pretty good progress for what we can do as a state to become a leader. We had been a leader in a lot of respects, uh, maybe over the last, uh, you know, seven or eight years, we'd kind of stagnated a little bit, and so now we're trying to accelerate forward again to, to join the the forefront and the ranks of, of all these different new technologies when it comes to, to transportation. 
And last, we had the Naseo uh, board meeting. Uh, I am the regional director for uh, this region, uh, Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, New, Mex or, uh, New Mexico. <clears throat> and so at the end of the day, I just reported on what was going on in the region. I am their connection. I'm considered a board of directors member for Naseo. Uh, as we know, Naseo is the association that we are closest to. Um, there's lots of great organizations just like ours across the country that do some pretty amazing things. And uh, we learn a lot from, from our brethren when we go and, and hear from them and hear what they're doing in their various states. And got a pretty good update from our president of, of Naseo as to what's happening in D.C. Um, we're already starting to talk about what do we need to look to this next FA reauthorization package. As we all know, the current FA reauthorization expires at the end of fiscal 23. Uh, and so we're already trying to formulate what is going to need to be included in that next FAA reauth package, and what are some state aviation uh, items that we'd like to see uh, included in that effort, too. So uh, that's the uh, director's report that I will provide to you today, commissioners, uh, but I'll stand for any questions or comments. Thank you very much for your presentation, Grayson. Um, next up, item seven, our <coughs> legislative congressional and regulatory update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, take uh, item A from uh, Sandra, who uh, wishes she could be here, but I know she's off enjoying uh, much better places uh, today. I think we're all a little jealous of that. Um, 2022 legislative session, uh, we have a few bills on the, uh, on the mark, and that is uh, our cap bill, first and foremost, which I know each one of you is aware of, uh, trying to lift or raise that cap uh, on our aircraft excise tax. Uh, if we continue the trajectory that we're on currently, uh, we will exceed that cap this year. Uh, I know we haven't exceeded it for a couple of years, but uh, given where aircraft prices are going, uh, I know that just as well as probably you all do, uh, seeing some of the aircraft prices these days, not just in the general aviation market, but the biz jet market as well. Uh, I, I foresee us exceeding that $4.5 million cap unless we just happen to have a, a revenue downturn in the last, you know, these next couple, three or four months. So. That's important to us. Uh, general appropriation for the agency, obviously we were very successful in that last year, getting the $2 million for the first time since the 90s, uh, looking to try and expand upon that and increase that uh, in the upcoming year. Uh, also uh, had a good meeting on Monday with our commercial airports to discuss this next item, which is the Commercial Air Service Incentives Program. Uh, this is a program that we are uh, working in partnership with, with our friends at the Department of Commerce. Uh, we know uh, how important it is to have direct routes. Uh, we've seen a lot of good announcements from both Tulsa and Oklahoma City over the last 12 months as we've recovered from COVID. Uh, a lot of new routes being uh, introduced and, and some uh, existing routes being expanded, uh, more, more route offerings there. And so one of the things that we've seen other states do and, and municipalities and communities too is trying to incentivize those additional direct routes. Uh, you're never gonna make a route out of nothing. You, you can't subsidize a route enough to make a route where there is no passenger demand. Uh, but at the end of the day, if there's a demand for that route and the airline believes that it can make a good profit for that particular airline, what we would be able to do is simply put the icing on the cake and, and hopefully uh, distinguish ourselves from the other states. And that's one of the challenges right now that you're seeing in the commercial air service market is we hear it, pilot shortage, commercial airlines are having a pilot shortage, all the major carriers are soaking up all the regional guys, uh, and all the regional guys are then looking to refill those ranks. And so, especially the, some of those smaller markets where the CRJ 700s, the ERJ 145s, 175s, 190s, et cetera, um, there's a lot of competition right now for that market. And so, if we as a state can distinguish ourselves from the other competition and say, hey, we have this minimum revenue guarantee, it may not be a big minimum revenue guarantee, it may not be a big incentive, but we have this incentive, we hope that when our airports are at the bargaining table, negotiating table with the airlines, that Oklahoma will stand out and that we would win out on that particular effort. And so uh, that, that's one of the bills that we're working on this particular year. And then of course, uh, maybe some tweaks to the Advanced Mobility uh, Council and Pilot Program uh, that we are working through. Those are the four main legislative initiatives that we have this year. And, and obviously we may call upon you all to to help in that regard, to, to call some of your friends, maybe to come up to the Capitol with us on Aero Oklahoma Day, uh, or at some other particular point in time during a committee committee process or, or a floor process, but, but really want to uh, make sure that you're aware of those different efforts. 
Uh, there's also uh, involved in this, and I think this is going to be a, a pretty interesting topic of discussion when it comes to legislative session, is, is the ARPA money uh, and, and how is the legislature going to look to spend some of that ARPA money that we know that the state now has. Uh, and we, as an agency, have put in a request for our airport modernization program and, and are looking to try and see how that's going to work its way through the process to get some of those additional dollars to put into airport infrastructure for, for recovery and, and pandemic relief. So. At the end of the day, it's, it's going to be a fun legislative session, uh, and, and I'm pretty optimistic given some of the, the, the rosy signs that we're seeing and, and hopeful that we'll be able to take advantage of the, uh, the, the budget situation that uh, the state is in and be able to invest a few more dollars into airport infrastructure and all the other things that we need to do to support the aviation aerospace industry. Uh, on the, the congressional update, uh, we have the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, we've talked a little bit about that. Uh, the additional infrastructure money that's coming to the state. Uh, each airport in Oklahoma, each classified airport that's a federal airport in the system is going to be getting some additional money out of, we call it EJA, I-I-J-A. Of course, we know the feds, we love our acronyms. Um, the, there's four major classifications of general aviation airports. The, uh, the top rank classification, the national classification is getting $763,000 a year for the next five years. Uh, Next classification, which is uh, the regional, they're getting $295,000 a year. Uh, you drop that on down further to the local classification, they're getting $159,000 a year. And then the basic classification is getting $110,000 a year. This is on top of the $150,000 a year of traditional non-primary entitlement funds that we've talked about uh, that each NIPIUS airport gets in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, our commercial airports are also partaking in getting some of this EJA money. Uh, so Oklahoma City is getting $6.7 million. Uh, Tulsa International is getting $5.7 million. And then Stillwater and Lawton are both getting just a, a smidge over a million dollars each. And so uh, there's a, a lot of discussions on how we're going to spend this money uh, at the airports, how our airport's going to be able to handle this. And I think one of the, one of the things that we've seen is, is this is really just getting us back up to par. Uh, we've seen a significant increase in the cost of construction over the last five, ten years. Uh, there's a study in Texas that they took a, an honest hard look at uh, surface construction, so pavement, concrete, asphalt, uh, cracked steel seal coats, etc. It's almost a 50 or 75 percent increase from the last five to ten years just for those construction costs alone, whether that's not, and that was, that was pre-COVID, uh, so that was the, the pre-COVID figures that we were seeing, and I know COVID's driven those costs up even further, and so as these monies are, are being pumped into, that's, that's really just going to help the airports get back to the point in time where today they may have to be phase, phase a project. If they had a, uh, what used to be a $400,000 project that may now cost $700,000, they would have had to phase that in two different phases over the course of multiple years. Moving forward with the EJA money, hopefully we'll be able to get that done in one phase, get in and out, do one runway closure, and not have to impact the aviation community uh, with multiple phase projects. The... Uh, Check my notes here. I think that was it for the congressional update. Um, <clears throat> on, the, on the regulatory side, I, I'm sure some of you have seen some of the news of the different things that are impacting aviation and general aviation. Uh, obviously, first and foremost, we have the 5G issue. I'm sure everybody has read about that in the newspaper, and <clears throat> I've had to get smart on that as well. Um, and it, it, it can be an impact. I think there's, there's some uh, challenges of FAA out there to make sure that they will still have a safe and efficient operational system uh, and they want to do what's most important. That's the first thing that is in everybody's mind, that is aviation safety. We don't lose airplanes in the United States. We have the safest air transportation system in the world uh, and, and our air traffic control system in the world is, is second to none. And so we want to make sure that any kind of a, a rollout is going to limit any kind of impact on, on commercial aviation and general aviation uh, as well. The, the other things that we are seeing, uh, the EPA has come out with a few items. Um, I think some of you may have heard uh, the endangerment finding potential coming for leaded gasoline. Um, and that is, I've had a couple of conversations with Senator Inhofe's office and our congressional uh, members that, that that's, that's coming. Uh, I think the EPA is going to issue an endangerment finding at some point uh, this year. And that's going to that's gonna start to clock. Uh, at that point in time, we'll have to find a way, as in we being the collective we industry, uh, we'll have to find a way to figure out what replacement options are there for 100 low lead fuel. As we know, right in our backyard, well, yeah, right in our backyard, uh, 8 Oklahoma, GAMI, has created a drop-in 
unleaded fuel. Uh, obviously, you have to go through the STC process, and that was the way they decided to run down the unleaded fuel proposition. They're adding more and more engines every day to that STC uh, to, that can use that uh, unleaded fuel. But we need to be able to find, as an industry, a unleaded drop-in replacement that's not going to have any burden on air, uh, aircraft and pilots and aircraft owners and is going to minimize the burden as much as possible on, on airports. And so that you can simply go from filling your tanks one day with 100 low lead and then the next day filling your tanks with 100 unleaded or whatever it's going to be called. Uh, and that at the end of the day is, is important. This is not going to be a quick timeline. Uh, one of the things that I know Senator Inhofe's office was telling me is that they're expecting this to be you know, 2030, 2035 uh, before uh, 100 low lead has to be cleared out. But that is something that's on the forefront of my mind. Uh, may require a, a letter from the agency. Uh, we may even try and get a letter from uh, the governor on behalf of the state, get a letter from our airports association. Uh, because we know that if, if we did go down the path of trying to get this done quickly, it's not going to go well and it's, it's going to impact our airports, it's going to impact the joint aviation community and we do not want to see that happen. So. Uh, at the end of the day, that is something that's near and dear to my heart. It, it's coming. The, the replacement's going to come. Uh, I think the, the mentality of sticking our head in the sand and, and just hoping that it goes away, uh, even the, the industry players, the gammas of the world, the AOPA, the EAs of the world, they understand that something has to be done. They just want it to be done on a timeline that's going to allow them, their members, their users to be able to adopt it uh, without having any undue burdens or costs on, on the market. And then last but not least, we have uh, some other EPA issues with uh, PFAS and, and some of the, the spray foams uh, that are in commercial firefighting uh, adventure, commercial air, airports firefighting equipment. Uh, obviously, that doesn't impact our drone aviation airports, but uh, some of the chemicals in PFAS, they're, they're trying to find a replacement uh, for the PFAS uh, foam that, that fights the fires equally as well. It's, it's very similar to what we're experiencing on the, the 100 low lead debate, but trying to find a equitable drop-in uh, fuel or liquid that will then fire, fight the fires just as equally as the existing system does today, which I know has been found to uh, have some problems in it. And so at the end of the day, that's the regulatory update I wanted to provide you all. Um, obviously, first and foremost, probably in your all's minds, is the 100 low lead issue, and, and I do want to keep you apprised of that. We'll probably start talking about that, if not at every meeting, probably every other meeting, uh, and just giving you a brief update on where we're at. Uh, and what, what steps do we need to take moving forward to ensure that our voice is being heard as a state uh, and making sure that the industry, if, if something comes forward, that we're going to be ready as a state to implement that. So uh, I'll stand for any questions on our legislative congressional regulatory update. Do we have any questions? Thanks for one comment I've already read where two airports in California have outlawed the sale of unleaded aircraft fuel, and the people in those airports are stuck. Uh, we sure don't need to, to see that happen in this neck of the woods. I, uh, I am <clears throat> cautiously optimistic that we won't have to worry about that in Oklahoma. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, California does what California wants to do. And, and I know there are uh, several entities, AOPA, EA included, that are trying to fight that through FA and say, hey, don't go jumping the gun and outlawing 100 low lead fuel ahead of the curve. And that's, that's, I think, what we're trying to figure out is what is going to be the, the national standard that we can move forward with so that a California or, or anybody isn't going to go jump the gun and outlaw 100 low, 100 low lead fuel uh, ahead of the power curve uh, and then impact, yeah, a lot of those folks that are just simply stuck out there. You would think the FAA would be on one side of this and the EA, uh, EPA on the other and let them battle it out between themselves, but the FAA is going to be our best voice on that. Yeah, I think uh, the, I, I too wish the FAA would take a stronger voice in that, Mr. Chairman. Um, They've kind of sat there on the side, and I think they've kind of done the whole uh, head in the sand, ostrich with the head in the sand proposition. And I think as the EPA's endangerment finding comes about and as FAA starts getting a lot more pressure from states, associations, congressional uh, delegations as, as well, and that's, that's one of the things I know uh, Inhofe's looking at, trying to figure out, okay, what, is there something we need a direct FAA to do in a congressional effort? Uh, is this simply done through the back channels? But we need FAA to start standing up to, okay, we know this is coming. Let's develop a plan, devise a plan, and, and figure out what the timeline is going to be that's equitable to everybody involved. Not dragging our feet, but also not trying to rush the horse out the barn either. 
All right, sir. Thank you very much for the presentation on that. Next up is item eight, sponsorship of Air <coughs> Oklahoma Day at the Capitol. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, sponsorship of Arrow Oklahoma Day at the Capitol, obviously this is one of our two major events that we put on every year uh, in conjunction with trying to advocate and uh, enhance our state's aviation aerospace industry. Uh, this year it's going to be March 30th uh, at the Capitol from 9.30 to 2 o'clock. would encourage each one of you to come and attend. It's, it's not going to be as big as it once was uh, given the Capitol is new. Excuse me, given the capital is new, they're, they're not allowing us to have booths on the fourth floor like we used to, so we're having our booths on the, on the second floor. Maybe we'll try and have some kind of a reception or, or at least a, a speaking opportunity on, on the fourth floor uh, where we can involve ourselves and, and have some of the, the good uh, opportunities. And so what Sandra is doing is she is instead pivoting and getting a lot of members of the aviation aerospace industry together to go up to the Capitol to visit legislators in their offices. Instead of having, you know, 70 or 80, 90 booths like we have had in years past, we're going to go to the legislature uh, and visit them individually with different groups of people. So we'll have a, a defense group, we'll have a civil aviation group, we'll have an airport group, we'll have a small air, aircraft group, uh, we'll have all kinds of different groups from all kinds of different, we'll have Tulsa group, we'll have an Oklahoma City group. Uh, to try and go visit legislators and tell them about their story and how aviation aerospace is important uh, to them and what they, you know, what doing the people's business means to the aerospace industry of Oklahoma. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're looking to have a thousand dollar sponsorship here. Obviously, we fundraise a lot of this through donations, and and Sandra does a wonderful job of that. Uh, this thousand dollars is just to make sure that uh, anything left over that we weren't able to fundraise for that we can uh, meet those end goals. And of course. If we fundraise and, and we match it all, then this thousand dollars doesn't ever get spent out of the agency's budget. But uh, staff does recommend approval, and I will stand for any questions. Do we have any questions? I move approval. Second. 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 Can you call the roll, please? Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Chairman Put or Commissioner Aye. Putnam. Chairman Hunter. Aye. So Mr. we have Putnam, I may have missed your vote. Okay. <clears throat> our next item is uh, <coughs> item nine, our sponsorship partnership with the Oklahoma Department of Commerce for the 2022 MRO Americas Conference in Dallas. Director Artis. MRO America is coming to very close to Oklahoma. Um, going to be April 26th through 28th in Dallas, as you had mentioned, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a traditional partnership that we have with our Department of Commerce. We have, I believe, in excess of 10 company partners coming with us this year, and we have a nice 20 by 20, maybe a 20 by 30 booth. Um, great opportunity for us to go out and not only sell the state, but allow these companies that are in the state to make those B2B connections to hopefully recruit some of their sales and opportunities to come back to Oklahoma. Um, so it's, it's a multifaceted show. Uh, staff recommends approval, and I will stand for any questions. Do we have questions? Do we have a motion? I move for approval. Do we have a second? Second. second. <clears throat> Can we call the roll, please? Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Chairman Hunter. Aye. Thank you. Our next action item, thank you, thank you very much for that. Our next action item is um, the OA, OA membership. Uh, Director Artes, can you uh, speak on that first? I think we may have skipped number 10. Did we? we did. Sorry, item 10, partnership with Oklahoma Department of Commerce for Airspace States Association membership. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the ASA is a uh, national association. The lieutenant governors uh, of all the different states uh, get together as part of this association. And we have in the past partnered with the Department of Commerce to split the ASA dues so that the lieutenant governor can partake in the ASA uh, program. And I uh, believe given our penchant for aviation aerospace in the state and knowing the lieutenant governor, uh, he still wants to partake in that. So uh, staff recommends approval for that split. And uh, I will stand for any questions. Questions? Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Second. Can we call the roll, please? Commissioner Potter. Aye. 
Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Chairman Hunter. Aye. Thank you. Now, our next item is number 11. <laughs> Thank you, Grayson, for your patience. Absolutely. Uh, OAOA membership, can you speak on that for us? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, OAOA uh, membership, uh, obviously this is one of our closest state partners, the Airport Operators Association. Uh, every year we have uh, joined the membership. This is also our uh, entrance into the or sponsorship for the annual conference and convention, uh, which will be this year, April 10th through the 13th in Oklahoma City. Uh, estimated cost is five thousand uh, dollars. Staff recommends approval, and I'll stand for any questions. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Can we call the roll, please? Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Chairman Hunter. Aye. Thank you. Our next item. Number 12, Statewide Commercial Air Service Agreement. Director Ardis, can you address that one? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, statewide Commercial Air Service Agreement at our December meeting. Uh, you'll remember that we uh, requested your permission to go out for an RFQ to, to look for services to do a brief study for supporting that legislative initiative we just talked about in Commercial Air Service Incentives. Uh, looking to enter into a contract with Forecast Inc. Uh, at an estimated cost of $60,000. And, and of course, as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, this will be a partnership opportunity with the Department of Commerce and that we're going to split those costs uh, with them as this is a partnership effort uh, because it is, it, it is a commercial air service development program and, and grant program, which is our wheelhouse, but it's also an incentive, which is obviously Commerce's wheelhouse. And, and again, we will be connected at the hip on this particular effort. But uh, staff recommends approval, and I will stand for any questions. Grayson, you say you're splitting the cost. Is that 30000 for us and thirty for them? Correct. Okay. Okay. So we, we will be the contracting entity. So our contract will be $60,000, and we'll enter into a contract with Commerce. And as we get invoices, we'll then invoice Commerce. OK, thanks. Yep. Do we have a motion for approval? I'm sorry. Jim, did you have? Yeah, I had a question. How long is this uh, project going to take? So the uh, overall study will probably be done sometime this summer. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're looking for at the very beginning is some very brief items that will help us go sell this bill to the legislature. So what are uh, some of the incentives? What are some of the returns? If, for example, the question is, if we get X and we're able to put that into Y direct route, what is the economic return to the state? And so we, we're looking for early adoptions for some of those items, some of those bullet points that will help us go feed uh, Commissioner Ortega's uh, friends at the, at the legislature uh, to help us pass through that process. But then also we'll be looking at this study for, okay, what are we going to, how are we going to set up the framework of this program? If this does come to pass, what do we need to do to stand up this program and what routes should we be going after? Because obviously each community has their top routes, which is you know, based on passengers per day each way. They all track that. And so if we know that, for example, there's 100 people a day going between Oklahoma City and Boston, obviously right now they're having to connect through some kind of community, whether that's Dallas or St. Louis or you name the, the connection spot. Uh, but now if we're able to provide direct service, what's that mean? We're providing direct service to Boston. What's that mean to those 100 people that are currently traveling to Boston each day? And just trying to rank out those different uh, communities and then obviously working in partnership with commerce because they're going after various companies that from these different communities and, and we've seen you know one of the things that they go recruit a company headquarters locations in town a they said we will not relocate a portion of our business to your state unless you have a direct route to that particular town and so the, that's where the the partnership opportunity comes is matching the the air service data with the commerce data and making sure that whatever money we're able to get moves forward in the right direction that we're able to get the best bang for our buck. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion? I move for approval. Second. Second. Can we call the roll, please? Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. 
Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Chairman Hunter. Aye. And thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Item 13. Chris, can we get a financial report, please? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Thank you, sir. Starting out with the financial summary document, as of the end of December, the Commission had an ending cash balance of $9.3 million. Conferences totaled just over $6.7 million. Our estimated statutory revenue for the remainder of FY22 is $1.6 million, and uh, remaining expected reimbursements to the agency total $1.4 the amount of remaining expenditures in the airport construction program that could be incurred this fiscal year, the next few months, total just over $3 million, uh, granted that those uh, grants are approved, which leaves us with an expected cash balance of $2.5 million at the end of this fiscal year. And our total expenses year to date are $2 million as of the end of December. On the revenue for December, we collected $763,892. <clears throat> total statutory total statutory revenue collected through December of this fiscal year was $3.1 million, and that compares to $1.8 million for the same time frame last year. So we're still running up about 70% compared to last year. Um, I will say last few months of the calendar year typically are our biggest months of the year, so um, I'd expect to see those revenue amounts uh, decrease some over the next few months, and that, that follows the historical trend. And then finally, the three-year average chart there, you'll see that our revenue collected so far this fiscal year is up about 850000 more than what our three-year average is. So still standing in a good uh, position fiscally. Happy to answer any questions. Well, I don't feel bad about authorizing $1,000 now. No. <laughs> <laughs> we have money to spend. Careful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, next up, we have item 14, Aerospace and Aviation Education Program Update. Paula, can you brief us on that, please? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, we have had some new commissioners who might be interested in really the process that we go through with our grant program. You know, how does it work? Um, we will post um, the grant application on the OAC website this next week. and. Applicants have the spring to write and to apply to us. The applications are due May 31st each year. And then we take uh, the committee, and that is Director Artes, Michelle Bozide, and Sandra Shelton, and I uh, take those applications and begin the individual work. Uh, the individual work is extremely important because we look at them, we read. If we have 60 applicants, then we read all of the 60 applications thoroughly, uh, each of us, before we come together as a group. And I will tell you that we take it very, very seriously. I, in particular, being a lifelong educator and a, and a grant writer, um, look, I'm usually on the other side of the fence. I'm the one writing the grant, as we did with the FAA grant and sending it off and hoping that that grant committee that reads that uh, is open to, to our ideas and, and to what we hope to do. So we take it very seriously. Uh, we then come together as a group and we begin going down uh, the, the, criteria, the criteria that we look at. I think, Michelle, there might be a slide. Is there with the rules? I'm not sure if there is. A, okay, there may not be. Um, uh, in the rules, the first thing we, we look at is the program description. Each applicant writes a summary and lets us know what they hope to accomplish uh, in their program. The second thing we look at are the grade levels served. What are the ages of the students that are served by that grant, or if they're young adults, or what are, even teachers in some cases, that would be served by this grant. I know there were some thoughts as, you know, how are our monies best served? What age group? do we look at that, that best will benefit from, from these grant funds? And there's a lot of discussion about that, and I understand that. Uh, I believe in working with superintendents this last year and a half, every day, a superintendent says to me, Paula, help us, help us back this down. If we teach the AOPA curriculum at Medill High School, I was in Medill last Friday, if we teach this AOPA curriculum, how do we back it down to our younger people because we know it's critical that these young folks, we pique their curiosity and then we begin building their skills. I believe and I, I firmly believe that the best way for students to learn and for us to get those students into this workforce pipeline 
is to start with our younger children and, and basically layer that aviation learning as they go up and as they enter the high school AOPA curriculum or choose aerospace, whatever it may be, then they get those obviously skills that they need to move to the post-secondary level. Um, I was reading when Medill has Friday, could you come help us? Could you, could you personally come down here and help us build these STEM programs? And I said, I'll be glad to help you and I'll be glad to share what we did in the Ada City Schools as we backed it down all the way to pre-K to A is for airplane and, and, and tried to add to first and third grade, fifth and sixth grade and move it up I'll be glad to help as much as I can because I do believe that. And I went home and I, I began to read and, and Purdue University did a study and I was really not shocked, but they said the ideal place for career learning is grades one through three. And that if you capture grades one through three, there's a 46% chance that those students will enter a high school STEM pathway. That's almost half. Uh, I think that's remarkable. And so I, I, I want to make sure that you understand that our school leaders in Oklahoma are looking to us to, to help them uh, develop some elementary programs. So after we look at grade level served, we looked at number of students served. And I know that's concerned you over the past years. And again, that's difficult because it's not apples and apples. If a high school has 25, uh, if Medill signs on, which they are, and they have 25 students in Aviation One, but those students have 185 school days of learning about aviation. That might be different than the 500 who go to a two-day camp or, a, or a, uh, uh, an engineering competition. It's hard to measure uh, the number served, really. And, but that is one of the uh, criteria that's on our rules. The next is the grow program goals and objectives followed by subject areas covered, and my most important one to me, desired learning outcomes. A grant can't come to us and just say, we hope to talk, hope they learn about aviation, and we hope that they uh, enter, they learn about aviation careers. Some of them do come to us, and that's what they say. We're looking for deeper. You know, what are they gonna learn? Are they gonna learn about aerodynamics? Are they going to learn about the uh, forces of flight, uh, the parts of the airplane. What, tell us what in your program, the monies that we're funding, are they gonna learn from that? And so those desired learning outcomes are critical. Some schools will actually put in the state learning standards and tell us what ones they're gonna cover. Others just are specifically saying they're gonna learn these skills. And then uh, measurement of success, how are they gonna measure their program was successful? In some schools, if they're teaching AOPA curriculum, they have, obviously they have assessments, they have tests, they can tell who, how many have passed those things, uh, how many are, are served or went through their camp. It's sometimes different to, difficult to measure the success. And then finally, what's their justification for funding? And we look at that, um, do they have community partners? Do they have industry partners? Are they going it alone and trying to, to wing a program here? Uh, so to speak, and, and put a program together. Who's helping them? Do they have other donors? Sometimes it's a tribal entity. Sometimes it's an industry entity that will help them. So we go down that list individually. We come together then, and we obviously look at the ones we know don't meet those criteria first <clears throat> and take them out of the mix. Uh, because again, we're looking at what they're learning from the, from the monies. Uh, then we go back again individually. We rank and we, we look at the ones and put them in order and we establish our questions and we come, to meet, come together and meet again, finally deciding how much to uh, offer of the requests and which, which entities we will fund. So that's the procedure. Uh, again, very, very thorough. Uh, when I was on the other side of the fence and came to you, it, you know, it was an interesting process to me to see what they were looking for exactly and, and uh, how we go about funding those schools. We then bring them to you in August, where you vote on this year, 50, I believe 49 or 50 different applicants uh, programs. And you'll have to agree with me, I think what a wide range they were from camps to schools to after school libraries and boys and girls club programs, extremely wide uh, to an app 
an aviation app for students to be able to get on and do aviation activities to some teacher professional development. So a wide range. And I don't want to, to labor all of this, but I do want, did want you to know the process that we use and that we are getting ready this week to post that and let entities begin putting their applications together. Had a call last night from Seminole High School. Walk me through this. What should, what should we be looking for? Uh, and, and I am a helicopter mother, and uh, uh, all these schools that are going into AOPA, uh, adding that to their school, I'm working with them diligently and trying to answer their questions because you can't, I said this last meeting, you can't say, I hope you teach aviation and good luck. I, I, I mean, you know, it, there are some steps that, that they're really having to work through, and I am so happy to be able to have that opportunity to help them. Obviously, I would stand for and welcome any questions you have about our grant program and how it works and any, any suggestions that you have. Jerry, I know you have some uh, interest in this. I do. Um, <clears throat> next year, or, or when, we, when we bring it before the board next time, I would prefer to see that broken out as where the the commission is actually voting on the individual entities rather than lumping them all together because there are some that are more qualified than others, some where the dollars were too low, and I personally would have taken some from this one to, to give to that one. At the end of the day, our and the other commissioners may not agree with me, but our objective is to put pilots in seats. And I agree that it starts very young, but we didn't seem to be putting a lot of emphasis on that final step to put the pilot in the seat or put the student in the seat. And I, I don't just speak hollow words. I've, I get, gave away 21 flight school scholarships last year myself, personally. And um, I just want to see you succeed, that's all. Right, and, and Director Ideas about this. Obviously, we're going to speak to that, uh, yeah. Jason. Mr. Chairman. Nope. nope. Yep. Okay. There we go. Um, you know, I, I think the uh, agree wholeheartedly. I, being a pilot, I, I love pilots and seats and, and trying to get there. Uh, and we can go back to doing it where we vote individually on each one of them. Uh, absolutely, have no problem doing that. At the end of the day, this is your all's program and and what you all want to, to direct the staff to do within the framework of, of the rules and the law. Uh, we can certainly do that. We were just trying to be as efficient and expedient as possible, having the consent docket where. You can vote on them as a group or pull out individual ones if you'd like to pull them out. But if, if we want to go back and do the 50 individual votes uh, and vote on it after each one, uh, I have no problem with that. I just I would caution you that we will probably have to plan for a three or three and a half hour meeting. And no, I don't have any problem with that. So, um, yeah. Uh, I, no, nor do I. We act on your wishes, obviously. And uh, I. As I mentioned to Grace, uh, Director Artis the other day, I, I, I think we'll have more applicants because the more work we're, more work we're doing and the more schools we're in, more the more visibility we have, uh, yes. And I think it will do nothing but grow. So we do need to think what, should, what the process should look like. I, I definitely agree with that. So. Yeah, we can get more money for it, too. Mm -hmm. It was about 215 ounce, what, three? We gave just 375 last year, which That's is impressive. exciting. Yeah. Yes, it, it is exciting. Um, and you mentioned visibility. I had a I had a superintendent call me last week. We need a flag. We need a flag that says Oklahoma Aeronautics. We want to fly it on our school. And and I said, what a grand idea to me. I mean, you know, that tells me that we're looking at at visibility uh, and and the building of programs and. And so, yes, I, I, I think you're exactly right, and I think that our grant program will grow. And I am open to, obviously, whatever your, your wishes are in that. Mr. Chairman, one, I have a reaction to, um, I do see it broader, that within the whole aviation community, we have all kinds of skills, and we need those. We need those throughout the state. So I would push back to say, let's not narrow it solely toward pilots and seats. Saying that, as far as trying to go through 50, I'm wondering <laughs> if there's a way to group them into the types of outcomes. I mean, we need to be smart, and this 
this commission needs to be in lockstep as to what is our outcome when we approve these grants, what are we trying to do? And if all of us are seeing it differently, we're going to have a hard time coming up with how we think we need to disperse the money. I put a lot of stock in what you all have done as far as the legwork. I agree with you that I think there's a happy medium between just saying we, we buy into all of them and asking some very probing questions. So if we can come together with a way to get at that. But I think the first thing is, as a, as a commission, we need to decide what is our outcome that we want with these grants. I think they've, there's been some outstanding successes, but we're getting more and more mature with now with the FAA grant, and we need to step back and say, how is that working together with some of the grants that we're giving um, through the, the commission. So yes, that's my I two agree. cents. Yeah. We've been hugely successful with um, aircraft mechanics, yeah. engineer STEM programs, yeah, exactly, that sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah. without pilots, there's no airplane. Well, I, this my <laughs> comment was not without. It's I, I don't want the grants channeled solely to pilot training to the exclusion of yeah, it, it hasn't yeah, been. Yeah, yeah, we've, yeah. We've no, I don't think balance. it has to date. I'm just saying if we were moving toward that, I would say, wait a minute. I'm encouraged that your focus is on desired learning outcomes and then measuring that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really important. Be, yeah. And yes. it has to be measurable. We've yes. oh, yeah. got to get a, yes. it's got to hand as, handle as possible on right. measuring the right. results. If not, yeah. Well, so, again, and, and, and I trust you and the staff mm -hmm. to go through those things ahead of time. I do. And I think that, that I agree, there's a happy medium. And yeah, I know there's one or two we look at and say, really, we're spending that kind of money on that. Mm -hmm. but, but overall, I think overall? it's, it, overall, yes. it's pretty good. And yeah. I agree with We've you on that. And we, and we can have the discretionary to pull something out of one of them. I think we always have. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. right. exactly. But right. again, I trust you all. And since you've been here, Paula, it's education especially well, thank you. Mm -hmm. and so I, I've been so encouraged uh, I was on a call with the Ardmore Development Authority yesterday and the folks from the Southern uh, Technology Center and they said help <laughs> help us it's the, the phone rings and help us but they want to put together a camp in Ardmore and uh, I'm, I'm what's encouraging to me is that these economic development offices are taking the lead in this and working with us schools in this in whereas before and it yes they were compatible but they weren't partners and and I think that we're seeing such a growth in that I've been in Enid three times what in the last month and there and Vance was at the table and the development authority people were at the table and all of those things uh, I leave there and I said this is how school is supposed to work this is how learning is supposed to work uh, not isolated, but rather as partners. And so we want our grants, and I, I totally agree with you, we want our grants to serve the best possible programs we can serve, and we will work to try to come up with a plan on, on what that best looks like. Fantastic. And again, we should be looking at economic development. And it doesn't mean just in Oklahoma City or Tulsa. It means in Enid or Ardmore or, or Bartlesville or any of these because aviation is a – they're high-paying jobs. Right. And so we want to recruit those. And if it's through education or whatever it might be, that's important. Yes, it is. And I, I've told, spoken to Director Artis about this several times, but if, if four out of five students in Oklahoma go to rural – area schools, right. it behooves us to make sure they have the same opportunities as students in metro areas. I feel strongly about that. And, and I think we're seeing growth there too. And one of the best assets every single rural community has is their airport. Exactly. I mean, that's what is the asset in the community. And most of these communities don't even know it. And it is a wonderful asset, and so we need to help them. That's yes. what we need to and do. And to, to an airport, every single per airport manager I've asked or said, would you work, would you visit with Payola? Would you, you know, would you talk to Winniewood or whatever? 
I mean the doors are open. Those parents didn't know anything about the airport and now they do. The students are at the airport. The lady from Seminole called me last night and said, Senator Taylor invited us all out to the Seminole airport today. I want to tell you about it. And, and that's the kind of excitement we want to generate and the kind of growth we want, want to see in rural Oklahoma as much as, as in, in metro areas, definitely. Any other comments or questions on the, our, our grant program? Then I'll want me to move to the FAA Workforce Development yes, Grant. Please. Okay. Um, as we told you last month, we are excited about this uh, almost half a million dollar grant we received from the FAA for the purpose of, purpose of aviation education. I didn't get into specifics last month, but let me just brief you kind of on the highlights of what this is going to mean. It's, it will allow us to identify five aviation, Oklahoma Aviation High Schools of Excellence. We have done that already, and those are schools that have already been in years three or higher of the AOPA curriculum. In other words, they've been on the runway, okay? They've been doing the work. And so we've identified those schools. The grant will allow us to help them build their labs, uh, <clears throat> equip them a little better. But the main thing it will do, and the grant will do, is to allow these aviation high schools of excellence to serve as hubs for student activities and for teacher professional development so that if prior is a school of excellence, which it is, then the 10 or 12 AOPA high schools that are just now signing on can work with prior to do STEM activities, to hear pilot guest speakers, they're already working on some ideas. So it will serve as a hub for our newer AOPA schools to answer questions and to mentor and to host programs. Uh, we also are going to be able to give, uh, as you know, our goal, I preached it a lot, is to hopefully have, by the end of the year, 50 AOPA high schools in Oklahoma. Uh, we are, as of Friday, when I go to Weatherford again, Commissioner Ritz, they're in. I'm going back to Weatherford. Uh, we, we, I think we'll have 41 or 42 high schools. We're moving in that direction. I, I went to Ketchum last week up by South Grand Lake Airport, adjacent, right adjacent to it. Very small school. They're in. They've already called prior and said, can we come over and visit? Will you talk to us about how you're implementing AOPA? And so one of the things will be those aviation high schools. But of the 50, we're going to, through the grant, be able to supply those schools with the $2,000 worth of lab resources they need to teach the AOPA curriculum. So if Bartlesville's one of the schools, if Weatherford's one of the schools, Enid will be, they've already signed on, then those schools will get the $2,000 of, of lab equipment that it, they need to teach those year one and year two courses. That's remarkable. That's a gift to those schools. And when I go out and say, not only here is the curriculum, it's free, but this year we're going to be able to help you with these resources. Uh, in year one, you might be interested to know, in year one of the curriculum, there are 19 hands-on labs. Well, that takes some, it doesn't take equipment, so to speak, but it takes building materials and things that they need to do those hands-on labs. And so the grant, the FAA grant, is going to allow us to provide that. It, we also mentioned last, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, but we are asked by AOPA to host the uh, professional development for teachers. It will be in, uh, at OU in July, but the grant will allow us to pay the lodging, the per diem, and the registration for those Oklahoma teachers to come to OU in July for that three and a half day uh, training. So that's part of the FAA, those grant funds will go to help us with the infrastructure of building our teachers up and preparing them to teach. We will get to hold an Oklahoma Student Pilot Day. We're hoping to hold it at Tulsa Tech and in, in the Tulsa area. Uh, we're also getting to host an AOPA two-day workshop at OSU Unmanned Airfield uh, next year, a two-day workshop where the teachers will come, get to work with uh, drones, and the lodging will be paid. They'll get to take that drone home back to their school to work in their classrooms with their students. Uh, <clears throat> so that, again, is a professional development. And one that I'm the most excited about, which is kind of strange, <laughs> but 
but I'm excited that we're going to host a leadership counselor, superintendent counselor summit at the Choctaw Nation Conference Center and in conjunction with Southeastern Aviation uh, so that our counselors know where a student that's been in AOPA coursework best fits at the post-secondary post level. If they're interested in air traffic control, where do they go? If they're interested in airport management, where do they go? Our counselors need counseling. And I'm hopeful that this grant, I know it will, will allow us to host an event where superintendents know what's going on. I've already met with Southeastern. They're thrilled. We're going to let them fly. We're going to have them over here at Southeastern and we're, you know, let them look at our new simulator, all of these things. One thing I will point out, OU is going to get to shine uh, when they host the AOPA professional development. OSU will get to shine when they host the UAS professional development and Southeastern will get to shine hosting the principals, I mean the superintendents and the counselors. So I think that this FAA grant is, is well crafted in that it meets student needs and teacher needs and school leader needs and we are really excited about it. I told Commissioner Ritz we've jumped in the deep end of the swimming pool if we're going to get all of these activities in eight, taken up and done in 18 months, but we're, we're happy to do it. Yeah, we can do it. We can do it. So that's the FAA grant and we've had one call with FAA and we're meeting this afternoon to, to jump in and dig a little deeper on what it looks financially and how do we how do we work with those funds? So we'll starting the work today, actually. And then C, the uh, Aviation Education Summit at Stafford Air and Space that we had a week ago Friday. I don't know if you've uh, noticed, well, you probably haven't been counting, but we've had four summits. We had one in Blue Jacket last summer up in Northeastern Oklahoma. From that Blue Jacket event is why Ketchum called me three weeks ago and said, can you come talk to us? We heard you at Blue Jacket. We want to talk about AOPA. So we had a summit at Blue Jacket. We actually had one in Okima early on. Uh, we've had one um, in southwestern Oklahoma at, in Lawton. And then we've had one a week ago Friday in Weatherford at the Stafford Air and Space Museum. Uh, Mayor Brown welcomed us. The museum welcomed us. It was a very nice facility and we had a nice lunch. There were about 10 school representatives there, ranging from Tuttle to Weatherford to Clinton to uh, Fort Cobb, Broxton, uh, little small schools, large schools there to hear about it. Um, Commissioner Ritz helped us by talking uh, about Sooner Flight Academy. We had representatives there from Career Tech and from ACES and Commerce, uh, from the AFA, and all of those folks had the opportunity to share programs uh, like Cyber Patriot and some of the other programs that some that these folks offer. So it was a good day. And from that already, I've had two calls and I'm going to go Friday to back to Weatherford and help them. She said, we're in. Now, now what do we do? And so we'll, we'll go there uh, from that. Any questions or comments on those particular reports? <clears throat> I would just comment, and I, and I think it goes to the heart of, with Paula now, I mean, things are not that we haven't had a great base, but um, I think things are really starting to come together. The amount of money that's coming from FAA is going to satisfy one need. Our money is going to satisfy another, and how we blend those together. But I remember, and all of us do, where if you had any desire to teach an aviation class, it was an uphill battle as a teacher. You couldn't fit it into the curriculum. You didn't have time. You didn't have money. You didn't have the expertise. And uh, way back, I remember giving some presentations at schools, and the teachers would say, I would love to do more of this, but. but. And now, to look at these, at the presentations, and to see these superintendents and, and teachers, it's like, I don't have to pay. The <laughs> curriculum's there. Uh -huh. I've got experts to help me. The energy's there. The kids are all involved. I mean, this is, we can't underestimate where this is heading, and I think it's, it's great stuff. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much. It's been, it's been my pleasure. It uh, really has. I do have one question. Uh -huh. Are these programs available only to public schools, or are they available to private schools as well? Private schools and home schools. Uh, Commissioner Rainey and I uh, 
met, and since then we've actually had, I was going to email you yesterday, uh, we have a homeschool cooperative, the Choctaw Middale area cooperative is already signing on. And so, yeah, I think it's exciting. It, it, it is private schools, it's, it's public schools. So if schools. they come forward, you know, are they If they come forward, and they've asked me to speak at the homeschool state conference that they have so that I can make other cooperatives aware of the process. It is kind of, you're right, it's intimidating. You don't, well, we can't, we don't have an airplane and we don't have a pilot. We have no we, money. You know, we don't have any money. So yes, it is a little intimidating, but once you walk them through it, it generally takes me about an hour and a half and I go door to door. And I'm not a salesman, but I guess I am in a way, uh, you know, it's free. <laughs> I, so. I've laughed yeah. since we left Okima because I left the room and they said, would you be our football coach? <laughs> 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 so anyway, it's been a pleasure for me. Uh, any other questions about, about that? So do we need to move to 15 then? We can now move to item 15, okay. uh, the AOPA professional development. Yes, I touched uh, on that briefly, Mr. Chairman. The, it's the week of July uh, 11th through 15th at OU. Uh, we had a phone call with uh, Lance Lampkin from Westheimer and Eric Widra, the OU director, and they're also they're going to provide flights for the teachers that come into the conference, and that's really exciting. Generally, at an AOPA national conference, they'll ask us to come. Like if we come in the night before, they'll say, "Do you want a tour?" United or do you want to tour FedEx or Boeing or wherever we're having that conference. This will allow them not only to tour OU, but also uh, to go up in the air, and fly over the stadium, you know, run the pattern and then and, and have, an, have an event for them. And we're appreciative to OU for, for making that happen. <clears throat> April Williams at OU is, is uh, obtaining the rooms where we will have the trainings because the cool thing is we're going to offer year one training, year two, year three, and year four, and we're opening it to, or they're opening it to or as a regional event. So there'll be folks here from Texas and Kansas and various place, places. Obviously, our FAA grant will only be paying the lodging and those things for our Oklahoma uh, teachers, but there will be folks from the region here attending. They hope to have, what they say, 80? We're limiting it to 80, but we can have 100, 120. It, yeah. it just depends on whatever the classroom space is and who, who signs <clears> up. We may have 50 of our own uh, because if we get to that many schools, th those teachers will have to come. It's required by AOPA that if you take their curriculum, the teacher must come to the training. So I, I like that idea. So. Um, mm -hmm. Leadership. I'm yes. curious what their their take on all this is with Oklahoma. And I think, Director, you've also visited with them at Maceo or somewhere, right? We, we had a really good, healthy conversation at, at Maceo um, <coughs> earlier, well, later last year uh, in Colorado. And, and they're, the, the whole reason they're coming to Oklahoma is because they see how we have adopted this. We, they see the passion that Paula has, and they've seen how the schools in Oklahoma have, have taken off with this. And so they, they see us as one of the the foundational leaders for this particular program i think I, I saw the stats for the current school year it was 300 plus schools across the country teaching it and oklahoma had 31. so we're 10 percent of of the population of teaching it and yes we are number two behind texas but I mean, we're working on it we're working on it you know they have more schools i i say well, let's look per capita not you know yeah. overall total numbers uh but but at the end of the day aopa is is extremely glad for what we have done uh, and and I would suspect that uh, they that's that's the main reason why they're coming here for the regional development professional development in the region uh, and and I suspect that they're willing to do other stuff with this on down the road maybe Oklahoma will become the permanent regional spot for them to do it I don't know but um, there's lots of those conversations happening and I'll say our relationship with AOPA has never been this good I agree and I, I have served from the beginning on the AOPA National High School Steering Committee, Education Steering Committee. That very first year, I'm sitting over there by myself going, oh my gosh. The lady sitting by me was a finalist for the space station and everything else. And uh, uh, I thought, okay, what do I have to offer to this? And, and it's what I just spoke about earlier is 
raising our schools up and how, how do you do that? And to me, I can with good faith go to a superintendent and say this is remarkable and it will not only change your school, it will change your community because I watched it happen. And so I, I'm able to do that and so now after being on that committee for five years, uh, we are going to meet at Frederick in March, I believe, and come together and talk about some of the other states. Some of our neighboring states don't have any schools teaching AOPA, uh, which is remarkable. I think Kansas may have one, and with as much aviation history as Kansas has, uh, you would think they would be on board. So uh, I, I think AOPA definitely wants it to us to help it grow, and I'm glad to, to help and do that. I had a call from Bentonville, Arkansas the other day. Can you get on a call with us? How, how, are, how are you all doing this? And so part of me wants to share and part of me <laughs> doesn't. Okay. Any other comments or questions? If not, um, let's move to our next item, item 16, a uh, flight simulator donation to Oklahoma LPA High School. Director Artes and... Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will uh, introduce this and then turn it over to uh, more knowledgeable people than I on this particular issue. Um, we were introduced to the Corporate Aircraft Association via uh, our good friend and resource Adam Fox at the, well, formerly of the El Reno Regional Airport. Um, they are uh, an association of basically a Part 91 corporate aircraft operators. They uh, have fuel discounts for their uh, association membership uh, across the state and across the country. Uh, and they, they were looking to try and, and make a donation. Um, originally, the donation discussion centered around, well, what can we do for 2022? Uh, we get a call about a week before the end of the year and said, hey, we actually like to do something for 2021. I think we all know why. Um, for, those that, for those of you that are in the, ball, in the donation ball game, um, and so uh, we worked up that, you know, we'd like to donate some simulators to the AOPA program. Uh, and so I'll let Paula uh, decide or discuss how we kind of came to the conclusions as to, okay, we have our existing centers of excellence, centers of high school excellence for the AOPA program, but what are going to become the next up and coming AOPA centers of excellence programs? And so uh, Paula, why don't you take it away there and kind of run through some of the mentality that we've had. Um, as director mentioned, these schools of excellence already have simulators. Many of them uh, will be getting some additional simulators through the FAA grant. So we we're not looking at them. We're looking at the next level of schools that we're we're trying to to raise up. And so I put together we we put together sort of a, a criterion checklist. Uh, the schools des designated to receive the simulators have been approved by the AOPA to teach the curriculum do not currently have a sim simulator, are working to develop partnerships with airports, workforce development teams, or industry entities, are committed to teaching the four-year pathway of a AOPA curriculum, understand that the school will be required to return the simulator to the Aeronautics Commission should the school, for whatever reason, decide not to fully implement the four-year pathway of curriculum, and uh, the schools are located in regions of the state that will allow for the growth of AOPA schools statewide. And so that's what we use to decide which schools would receive. <clears throat> the funding that he offered, the donation, allowed the purchase of five uh, Redbird J-Velocity simulators, which a lot of our schools are using. And so the, the, the schools that we felt meet the, the criteria that we just mentioned are Bartlesville High School, Lawton High School, Durant High School, Alva High School, and Duncan High School. And again, uh, obviously we'll stand for any questions you might have about how those were selected out of the schools that we, that we have. We have not, obviously until you uh, act on this, we, they're, they're not aware that this is even in a discussion, but I did some background legwork to make sure they were committed uh, in moving forward with the program. Obviously, we don't want to give them a flight simulator until we, we know that, so. So to summarize, we have a donation of simulators to our program and then we choose who's most worthy. Correct. Okay. Based on the criteria that, which yes. sounds straightforward. Yes. I move we approve. Second. 
Take a roll call. Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Chairman Hunter. Aye. I did email <coughs> Mr. Boards the, and the Corporate Aircraft uh, Association and let him know how we were going to go about selecting these schools this weekend. And he emailed me back <coughs> Sunday evening and said, I can't think of a better way to get pilots in the seats than for us to donate <laughs> to these schools. Sure. And, and I'm hopeful, we're hopeful, that they, if we manage this with fidelity, that they will look to us again uh, for donations. So thank Fantastic. you very much. Thank you. Our next item is item 17, the Oklahoma Airport System Plan Update. Nick Young, can you please speak on that for us? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Thank you, sir. With the Oklahoma Airport System Plan Update, that's a project that's been ongoing for about a year now. We have another five to six months to go on that, so that is on track as scheduled as an 18-month project as we originally anticipated. And that's primarily due so, to some cost analysis that we wanted to add to that project. Uh, that I'll speak to here in just a moment as well. So with that, the initial data collection has already been completed of all the on-site visits that were scheduled and the preliminary GIS database work has all been completed to this point. Right now we're working to finish out the technical report, which is the primary document for the uh, system plan. And uh, five of the seven chapters that have been completed and sent to FAA for their final comment as well. The final two, again, waiting on the final cost anal analysis from our consultant to be complete before we add that to those two chapters, do uh, have our OEC staff, uh, me, do the rest of those reviews and then send those to FAA for their comment as well. The technical report provides a full inventory of the system as it stands today, and it also includes facility and service objectives based on the roles that we've kind of divided all of our system airports into. So we're going from three roles previously to four roles now, and each of those roles have different goals and objectives for those airports based on their traffic, their size, and what they can, their system constraints as well uh, for their properties and those types of things. So um, these recommendations provide, um, or excuse me, this technical report also provides recommendations to each airport. So not only for the roles do we have our goals and objectives, but we also have recommendations for each airport um, based on these criteria, and that includes planning level estimates, so that's cost estimates for the projects that are recommended for each of the system airports. And so that will be represented in individual airport reports, which are in their draft phase right now. And we'll send all of that information once the cost analysis is done, finish out the individual airport re reports, which are about 90% designed right now. And then we'll send those to individual airports for their review before we complete the project. So our intent there is to get information to <laughs> the nth degree and have that uh, as updated as we can before we go to full publication with the system plan come the end of June 2022. In addition to the individual airport reports, the executive summary is uh, also under construction right now. That's about 80% done, and again, just waiting on that additional cost analysis, <coughs> excuse me, that additional cost analysis to be completed before we enter that into there, and then do our review, and again, send to FAA for final review before moving forward. And then additional to, in addition to the physical documents we have for this project. We're also working to put this information into a GIS database as well. As I mentioned, the initial um, kind of work through on that has been completed. Here just about a week or two, we got the link to go ahead and start doing some quality assurance work throughs on that on our end with our staff as well. And so that'll be ongoing basically between now and the end of June. This is really meant to be a visual representation of the information gathered over the course of the entire project. Because what we don't want is a document that sits on a shelf doesn't get put to use because that doesn't do any of us any good and it also doesn't do our system airports any good either. And so this is uh, all going to be put into a GIS database very similar to what uh, was presented before you by Kelly Fincannon last month with our APMS system, our airport pavement management system. And so there will actually be a dashboard to where you can go see all of the GIS information for the system plan and then also a link on that same dashboard to the pavement management system as well. Um, so we see this, obviously, for us, an extremely helpful tool for our planning and pro programming purposes, but we want to make sure that that's available to our airports and their consultants as well, because we want to make sure that all of the information is up to date as possible in this GIS database, and that we're using that to plan for our, you know, airport construction program, our five-year plan, and they're also doing that for their five-year plans as well for their individual projects. 
<coughs> excuse me. And uh, in addition to that, we have also completed four of our anticipated five webinars for the public, um, you know, webinars that we've been holding over the course of this project. Um, all of those are still available via our YouTube site. And uh, we have at least one more coming between now and June. And again, just waiting for that final cost analysis to be complete. <coughs> Excuse me, to be completed. And then the other aspect that uh, came to mind, uh, Commissioner Potter, is, uh, you know, you mentioned that a lot of our communities don't see the asset that they have or realize the asset they have in their airports. So what we are hoping for is that this system plan works in conjunction with our economic impact study that we completed in 2017, as well as the APMS system to work in conjunction to show here's your economic asset you have in your, your community, here's the condition of your payment as it stands today, and here's the objectives based on where you're at in the role in the system, so that then we can use that information to see here's where we're at today, where do we want to go in 5, 10, 15, 20 years down into the future. And so this will be the last piece of kind of that three-prong approach that we use to try to get that into place and plan for the future for our system. So that's where we stand today, and uh, with that, I will answer any questions. How often do we do this update? Is it every five years? Um, I think the last time we, we did a full-on update to this extent, and Director, correct me if I'm wrong, was uh, 1999. And I know we've done, we've done updates over yeah. the time <laughs> since then, but our last full scale to this extent, um, and then we've done some small ones over the course, so I'll defer. It, it, it should be 12 to 15 years. Every 12 to 15 years, you should do the major update like this. Or if there is a, uh, you know, let's let's say the Jetsons happened overnight and we have to totally reevaluate how we do aviation, obviously the, that kind of a, a item that would require this. But this kind of a full-on update, probably 12 to 15 years, and then some, some moderate tweaking changes. And that's the thing, this is a living document. So if, if an airport gets classified as X one year, five years from now, they may end up being classified as Y. So, and that's, that at the end of the day is that that's, again, this is us presenting to you. Eventually there'll be action that's going to be needed to adopt this system plan, which then helps us as staff guide the investments, the decisions, and, and helping the airports fill that particular role that the outside consultant, the third party, has identified that they believe, based on the study, has done for that particular community. Okay. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, don't run off. <laughs> Number 18, Wind Energy Development Act Compliance. Yeah, you've got a couple for me for uh, this one, Mr. Chairman. So on uh, the Wind Energy Development Act Compliance portion, uh, again, this is just a review of what we had in 2021. Um, and so over the course of calendar year 2020, we're on, we received 20 notifications from wind energy projects across the state. Um, in your packets, you have a list of those, and as you can see, you probably see a few of those names of projects um, within your commissioner's packet. Um, of there are several names that are the same, so we get the initial notifications. We'll send those off to the Oklahoma Strategic Military Planning Commission for their review. They'll work with the uh, Department of Defense if they need to set up mitigation committees for those those projects. And so, as they have those conversations, obviously those initial plans uh, usually get modified if they're in areas with. Uh, some complicated airspace. So that's why you'll see several no subsequent notifications that come through over the course of the year as well. So we have 12 unique uh, wind energy projects that we've been working through uh, with some of our sponsors over the course of 2021. Of those 20 notifications we've see received, 13 of those have received the desired mission compliance letter that comes from the Department of, Department of Defense that then allows them to start construction in addition to all of the other requirements. But until they have that letter, they need to stop, you know, that's part of the reason that uh, the Wind Energy Development Act was included in Title 17 was because there was some preemptive building going on. And so with those 13 of the 20 projects have the letter they've been waiting on. The other seven, um, as you can see in the, the, the list that I mentioned before, um, some of those have uh, several, uh, <laughs> some of those individual notifications each within one specific project. There might be three letters one project is actually waiting on. And so the multiples that you see there, um, you'll, uh, that's not all that out of the ordinary because for those that are going to a mitigation committee, they can often take months of conversation and negotiation to really figure out, okay, this can go here, but at this height rather than this height. And so that's uh, with, we've had you know, 13 of the 20 come through on that and that's pretty much as expected for the course of the year in 2021. And with that, I stand for any questions. Are we keeping them out of the uh, Air Force uh, Navy low-level training routes? 
that's the yes. That's what the, whenever we receive those, we send that, send that off to the chairman of the Oklahoma Strategic Military Planning Commission. He works with all of the installations across the state, and then of course with the Department of Defense in Washington as well. And so we don't necessarily sit at the table with those conversations unless we're asked. But uh, but that's the whole point of us and it to them is to make sure that all of those military training routes were being protected in the state of Oklahoma. I might add on there, uh, Mr. Commissioner, that we have seen a 180 degree change in the way things are being done in Oklahoma since Representative Ortega at the time was able to champion Senate Bill, excuse me, ooh, House Bill 2118, uh, and obviously all the predecessing uh, legislation that went into that. Um, it's, it's been a 180 degree different uh, working atmosphere. So there, there are still turbines that are going up. There are still turbines going up in military training routes, but there are gaps that are being provided. There is tolerances and allowances. And that, that's something the forefront of our minds is if we ever got to a situation where the military thought, no, we are back at a situation where we need to take action because DOD uh, headquarters is not really uh, partaking to the responsibility that we have put th put on them, and if you'll remember, as a part of this legislation, you have to get two thumbs up. Thumbs up from FAA, thumbs up from DOD. Thumbs up from FAA is virtually assured. I've never seen FAA issue a thumbs down on a wind turbine, but I know DOD has definitely issued some adverse letters uh, based on turbines that it believed was going to negatively impact the military mission. And so at the end of the day, uh, the last you know two, three years, it's, it's been a totally different working relationship. I don't foresee for the next five, 10 years that we're gonna have a problem, but if we do, we'll go back to the legislature, explain our case, and, and see what we need to do from there. But I'm, I'm very confident that everybody is very happy with the process as it stands today, and we don't have to worry about a um, situation happening like what happened out in Western, uh, Oklahoma, or just past the Western Oklahoma City metro area. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Let's move on to item 19, our five-year airport construction program. Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the five-year airport construction program item here, this is uh, staff requesting approval for the engineering fees and authorizing staff to enter into a contract for the design, bidding, construction, and grant administration for the AWAS package. And so with these engineering fees, we, as um, we were able to work with two different consultants to break this uh, AWAS package into two different groups. For group A, this would be for um, the AWAS systems at Ada Regional, Alva Regional, and Fairview Municipal Airports. The total engineering fees for those three projects totals $97,485. And again, this covers the, uh, the full final design, the bidding process, preparation and oversight, qu uh, construction quality assurance and quality control, as well as any grant administration for these projects. So the OAC uh, portion of that is $92,610, with the sponsor shares coming up to $4,875 for the first group. For the second group, that's Claremore Regional, Grove Municipal, Salazar Municipal, and South Grand Lake Regional Airports. Engineering fees, again, with those four categories being covered there under that cost at $117,900. Uh, commission shared just a little over $112,000 for that group, and 5,895 cumulative airport sponsor portion for those projects. And as uh, you may have noticed, previously we mentioned uh, wanting to go forth with eight of these projects as part of the AWAS package. After further discussion with Director Artie's, myself, and some of the, uh, the airports that were in contention, we decided to hold off on one of those. And so we come before you with these seven, and we uh, do request approval for those uh, engineering fees, and I stand for any questions. I have a question. Why the difference in price? An AWOS system is an AWOS system. The only different factor is the distance of the antenna from the base station. Why do we have two different price schedules? Oh, sure, if uh, you don't mind. M Mr. Chairman, the, the difference in price, because uh, obviously you're probably pulling this out on a per airport basis uh, and seeing the divvy, the three divided by four. Um, the the AWOS at South Grand Lake has was already designed in a previous project. Uh, and so that cost is not having to be included. It was not built under that project because FAA implemented some of those dirty rules that we talk about, the benefit cost analysis. And so at the end of the day, uh, the B item would be a little bit higher if that had not already been designed. So that's why you're seeing the difference in price there. One for three, one for four. Gotcha. 
All right. Um, do we have a motion? I move for approval. Second. Can we call the roll, please? Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Chairman Hunter. Aye. Thank you. Next up, Mr. Young, we have item 20, incoming projects or upcoming projects for calendar year 2022. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so as we did in uh, uh, the latter part of 2021, obviously we did a review with uh, one of our airport engineers, Mr. Ben back here, uh, gave you a review of what we completed in, uh, excuse me, calendar year 2021. So what we wanted to do today was to give you a preview of the grants that we anticipate bringing before you for appro approval for calendar year 2022. The first on the list is the AWOS package that we just mentioned. So we just uh, thank, thank you for just approving for those engineering fees. Uh, total project cost um, for the entire project was previously listed in the ACP at 1.25 million. Uh, again, that'll come down as we uh, adjust that down to the seven total AWOS systems for the AWOS package. And uh, the, as we get closer and through work throughout that process, we'll get instead of this higher planning number level, we'll continue to update the ACP and bring that before you in future updates as well. The next project that we'll have coming your way, I say the next, but the next on our list here would be the hangar program that uh, Director Artie's presented before you on my behalf in December. Um, whenever I couldn't make it, again, my apologies for missing that meeting. Didn't want to get anybody sick, as I'm sure we can all understand. Uh, so with that hangar program, uh, several, uh, excuse me, nine projects, or excuse me, seven projects in that list, ranging from Ardmore, Ardmore Municipal, uh, Grove, Okima, Pauls Valley, Hugo, Stroud, and Thomas airports. The total um, project cost on those uh, across all seven is anticipated uh, of just a little bit over $19 million, thanks mainly to the Ardmore Municipal MRO facility. But uh, the commission share on that coming in at just over 2.3 million anticipated for those seven projects in the hangar program. And again, those will be condensed and as we work on down the line, we'll get better numbers. Uh, most of those, uh, many of those, we anticipate hitting the max grant or loan numbers. So the commission share might not change, but you'll probably see some different uh, numbers that come in on the individual project ACP sheets on down the road. Next is the various location grant which is our typical FAA grant we get on an annual basis to work on preparing preliminary engineering reports for future FAA discretionary projects. It's a 90-10 split uh, percentage from FAA grant for a total project cost, or excuse me, total cost on that planning effort, $500,000, the commission share being 50,000 of that. Next, we have a project for Atoka Municipal. We are still looking to go forward this calendar year for a preliminary siting study for a new airport location. As we can see there, they're pretty hamstrung in terms of any growth or possibilities there on pretty much all sides. And so we are looking at a potential new airport location. And we plan to bring that before you this year as well. That would be a state only grant. So a 95-5 proposition at 150,000 total with the commission share at 142,500 there. Uh, the next project is uh, Claremore Regional Airport. We are looking to rehabilitate a portion of the terminal apron out there. It's a FAA grant, so we'll be covering half of the 10% match on the local side. So the commission shares 50,000 of the total project cost, $1 million for that project. Clinton Regional Airport has two projects we anticipate being brought before you for a grant approval this year. The first is the mill and overlay of the terminal apron at 508,000 total cost, and then the commission share on that 325,000. And then right after that, we have the rehabilitation of the runway, uh, 1735, that will be a FAA grant that we'll be helping participate in. Total project cost at 2.8 million, with the commission share at 125,000 for that one. At Enid Woodring Regional Airport, we anticipate bringing before you a grant to reconstruct runway 1331 out there. Again, it's another uh, mix of FAA state money for $1.9 million project cost with a little over $380,000 for the OAC share on that one. At Grove Municipal Airport, it's another runway rehabilitation as well as runway light rehabilitation for that airport. It's a total project cost of $3.5 million with a little under 166 uh, commission share on that one. At Kingfisher Airport, this is a state-only grant 
that we anticipate bringing before you for a total project cost of $400,000 to reconstruct areas of the taxi lanes in the apron area. Another state-only project, 95.5, with the commission share at $380,000 on that. At McCurtain County Regional Airport down in Idabel, another runway rehabilitation that we are looking to pursue at $3.36 million, and the commission share on that, $155,000 and some change. At uh, Muskogee Davis Regional Airport, a uh, large electrical project out there that we're looking to pursue to rehabilitate their runway lights, pappies, beacons, their electrical vault, and their home run. This is a $1.9 million project coming at just under $89,000 on the commission share. At Tahlequah Municipal Airport, we are looking to rehabilitate their apron as well and improve some areas of the safety area on for the runway. It's a $1.1 million project uh, with the commission share coming in at $500,000. And last but not least, at Tulsa Riverside Airport, while many of us have always called it that, it's still weird to see that as the, uh, the official name in my eyes, but uh, at Tulsa Riverside, we are looking to reconstruct the connector taxiways for the primary runway one left, one nine right. As you can see, pretty complicated taxiway system there. For a total project cost to rehabilitate those at just under 3.2 million, with the commission share again helping with the sponsor share on that FAA grant at $150,000. Those are the list of projects we anticipate bringing before you for grant this calendar year, and I stand for any questions. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Item 21, we have a proposal for executive session to discuss the employment of the director, pursuant to Title 25, Section 307B1 of Oklahoma Statutes. Is there a motion to approve to convene into executive session? I shall move. Second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Chairman Hunter. Aye. Okay. Is there a motion to return to open session? I shall move. Second. 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 Call the roll, please. Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Chairman Hunter. Aye. Thank you. I, uh, following our executive session, I uh, would make a motion to raise the salary of our director position to $125,000. That still leaves some room below the cap and we will later move toward getting that cap raised. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. second. <laughs> Can we call the roll, please? Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Chairman Hunter. Aye. Thank you. Congratulations, sir. Thank, Thank you Mr. very Chairman. much. Appreciate it. We value everything you're doing. Well, I value you Keep all. Keep it up. Good job. I will do my best. Um, the motion passes. The recommendation is adopted. Uh, concluding remarks. Are there any additional comments from staff or commissioners? No. If not, we need to set the date for our next meeting. It looks like, what is the date set for the next commission meeting? Fantastic. Um, hearing no objections, we'll meet next on March 9th at 10 a.m. here at the Utah Commission meeting room. Um, is there any new business that needs to be discussed at the next meeting? Mr. Chairman, not on the new business, but back on item 22. Uh, one of the considerations I know we discussed uh, in terms of future meetings, maybe having at a different location. Uh, so I just want to bring that to your all's attention. We may try and find an off-site location to have a commission meeting like we've done sometimes in the past. Um, I know when we were at Weatherford for the uh, education summit a couple weeks ago, they, were, they, they offered to host us. So that might be an option on down the road. Would that start in March or or April? I, I think March we're good for here, but we'll it may, maybe one of the other meetings later in the year, uh, or it could be April, uh, could be later in the year. So I just want to bring that to your all's attention. Okay. 
All right. Thank you very much, sir. Is there any new business or any matter not known about or which could not re be reasonably foreseen 24 hours before this meeting? Okay. Uh, notice was posted prominently and publicly at the principal offices of the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission at 110 North Robinson. The Oklahoma Department of Transportation at 200 Northeast 21st Street at 10 a.m. Tuesday, January 25th, and the Oklahoma Aer Aeronautics Commission website at 10 a.m. Tuesday, January 25th. Um, I call this meeting adjourned. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. There. Yeah. Yeah.